If you can see my hand, would you raise your hand? Very good. Old Girl Scout trick. <laughs> that works. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Oasis. I am Jennifer Payden, one of your new your board members. I would like to extend a special welcome if you are here for the first time. Um, we thank you so much for being here. And I encourage you to go to the desk out there. David Oliverio is our official greeter today, and he'll be happy to answer any questions, um, explain where the bathrooms are, tell you where the show you where the coffee is, all that kind of stuff. If you are not here for the first time today, if this is your second time, or your fifth time, or your 50th time, or your thousandth, thousandth time, I want to thank you especially for making us a part of your Sunday morning. Your presence is vital to what we do and who we are. So thank you. Um, we are going to have a great program today. We're welcoming back Joseph Crump for our musician. So he will be playing a couple of songs and then we'll have our main talk by Anthony Cruz Pantojas. And then we'll have a little break um, to refresh coffee or whatever, and then we'll have a question and answer period, if that's okay. And then we'll have some announcements and another song, and then we will go forth. So anyway, Joseph, please take it away. <laughs> Two, there we go. Always good to be back at Oasis. Um, it's a gig I look forward to, so thanks for having me. Just 
Just as long as you're considered contraband indeed Without you The world is colorless, it's true But those days are gone So I wrote this song Appreciate that Thanks so much. Um, this is a song, uh, these are all songs I wrote. This one's more about, I have this problem where I tend to argue too much about politics with the wrong people. Um, because it's fun, right? But, but my problem is, you know how when you argue with someone right away, like you know in the first couple minutes it's not going anywhere, right? Like, like they're like, stop the steal, and like, you know, just, they, they're on like a totally different universe and there's, you, you know right away, like there's no point in this, but you keep going sometimes, right? And you're thinking the whole time, like what a stubborn idiot this person is. But who's really the stubborn idiot if you think about it, right? So this is, a, this is an attempt at reflection and self-correction and, and I was hoping this song would serve as a form of therapy and it hasn't worked, but I, I hope it's at least a decent song, so. stupid or even deluded but on this one subject you might be a little befuddled you're thinking it's muddled i just want to help to set you free i laid out the facts and i hope in vain that you will open your eyes your verbal attacks don't Give me faith that you will soon realize that you're mistaken and you need to take in new information as it comes. But you're so unbending, this is an ending. I feel like I'm staring at, at the sun. But I can change your mind. Maybe it's best if I leave it alone. I think you're blind. Can tell that you're set in stone. But after a while, I start to reflect if I have no effect on your views. Which one of us is stupid and thin? Am I in politics if I keep?
Thanks so much. Thank you, Joseph, for keeping it real. This is me checking my cell phone to make sure that it's on silent. As a recent offender, I can tell you all this. So maybe if y'all would just do the same so that our speaker uh, will have our full attention. Our main speaker, speaker today is Anthony Cruz Pantojas. He is a PhD candidate and ethicist who serves as the humanist chaplain at Tufts University. He might be kind of glad to come down where it's a little bit warmer <laughs> right now. So um, his talk, I think, is going to dovetail very nicely into one of our core beliefs over here. Um, meaning comes from making a difference. I cannot think of something that makes a bigger difference than truly and deeply listening to somebody. So, Anthony, welcome. Good morning, Oasis. I am delighted to be here again. I have to confess that when I got Jacob's email saying, would you like to come down um, to our new place? Um, in February, I was shocked and surprised that I was invited once again. Um, nonetheless, I am truly, again, in full transparency, a little distracted because as I was coming in, the elevator, I read the mission and vision of the Monroe Center. And so I am feeling so divided in many directions, kind of connecting it, of course, to voices and what I'm going to be presenting. So please bear with me as I try to rail in my brain. Um, my name is Anthony Cruz Pantojas. I use they, them series pronouns. Um, as it was mentioned, I serve as the humanist chaplain at Tufts University. And it's a delight to be here in this community. Um, the first time I was here, the community was split since you were all, I think, at an atheist conference. And so it was half of the community was not here. So it's definitely um, such a delight to see growing numbers. My talk today is on masking the human uncondition, how deep listening reveals our shared humanity as a lot of the work that I do, this is a work in progress. Um, nonetheless, it was being developed in part through the inspiration of a course that I taught earlier this fall called The Practice of Being Human, Humanism for Everyday Life at Tufts University at the Experimental College. And as I heard of Oasis moving physical spaces, I said, this is the great place to go and invite us into deeper thinking, listening, and exploration. Oh, beautiful. It doesn't move here, but anyway. So um, I will start by talking about my positionality. Let me see, hold on, if I can move it here. Oh. You know, you would think that after years of doing COVID, people would know how to work tech. No problem. I will pull up my phone. So as every talk that I give anywhere, maybe in higher education, a community center, any other space, I begin by talking about where I am today in my own understanding as an unfolding human being that's always growing, progressing, sometimes regressing. Um, nonetheless, just so that you have a sense of where I am. So I identify as a queer Afro-Boricua. I am a first gen. Even though I have an amazing job, I'm still in the bracket of low income. Um, I am neurodivergent and a nonlinear thinker and processor. Um, and so I always like to um, start my talks by giving that, not just to center myself, but also to allow other people to understand that we are not all necessarily the same, that we don't see the world or experience here or sense in the same exact ways. And so, as it was mentioned, how do we begin to look at meaning through and with difference? And then I just share briefly about my own academic, um, again, positionings as a transdisciplinary scholar, practitioner, activist, especially looking 
through the frameworks of cultural studies, decolonial thought, and spirituality from a Caribbean lens. Okay, so um, again, when I heard that I was invited again to come and give a talk, I quickly went to Facebook and the website just to see some of the comments and chats and exchanges that have been happening. And this is just one um, paraphrasing quote that I read from your Facebook page. Um, again, it's a very short snippet, so not the full context. But basically, I was fascinated by the fact that you all moved, not your first move, to this place because, quote, you want it to be more accessible and central. Is that true? Is, th is that quote? Okay. So that seems very superficial. So when I came into the space and saw that you were here specifically, my heart jumped because for me it's reflecting we're not just moving, you know, without understanding, without knowing, without um, knowing where you're headed, but actually being intentional about the spaces that you occupy and with whom. And specifically, how do you begin then to develop relationships that are empowering, that are centering diversity, and that require, as my talk is kind of alluding to, deep listening. If you want healthy, good, robust relationships, if you want to occupy spaces through relationality and not just filling a space that's fractured. And again, um, in a time where we are such immersed in anti-relationships, and I'll get a little bit into that a little bit later, it's so important that when we come into, in this case, institutions that have been here for a while, for a few decades, and we are beginning to enmesh ourselves into these spaces, moments of rupture, of tending, right, with physical spaces, in this space, in the surrounding communities, in the neighborhoods. And so how are we, for example, listening to the stories, and I'm getting ahead of my slides, but it's okay, <laughs> to the stories, to the narratives that are here in this community that we do not and hopefully are not intentionally disregarding or not listening to. And so the, the second, um, and I'll put my phone again, my apologies. The second one is how are we again listening internally, right? So hopefully this was a process that was done in community by the membership, really trying to leverage the complexities of what does it mean to move? I don't know about you, but I've moved a little bit and each time it gets harder and harder, or at least my body feels it. <laughs> especially carrying the boxes, right? So again, the fact that you all move speaks internally about a desire to continue to grow, a desire to move away from complacency and conformity to saying we need to bet for more. And then third, what is there to learn? And moving forward, as you become embedded in this space and community. Because again, this is not just a brick and mortar, this is a community center for the LGBTQIA community. In a state, as we know, well, dot, 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 anyway. <laughs> right, so again, really paying attention to how are we building coalitions, relationships, and not just recognizing each other's humanities, but as the title is talking about, challenging the conditions where, unfortunately, we're not all seen as human. We're not all, quote, worthy of being seen fully human, being allowed to unfold, learn, unlearn, challenge our prejudices, our biases, misunderstanding, miscommunications, missteps. Where are the spaces where we can actually gain the resources, 
the relationships, again, sorry for repeating that word so, so much, but also the spaces to practice being human. And for the sake of this talk, humans that have the intentionality of deeply listening, which, I, and I forgot to bring up a quote, I believe it's less than 5% of the human population is actually trained to listen. So we can hear, and even that can be challenging, right, depending on our ability within our bodies and our senses, but how are we listening? So, um, I also wanted to talk about, as we are thinking about, you all moved, you're in a new place, you're in this new institution, you're building relationships, you're listening to each other, listening to your stories, to your histories as a network, right? So again, you're not in isolation, you're the OASIS network. You're beginning to listen in multiple directions. How are we also listening to steal the unfolding impact that COVID continues to have in our communities. As I said before, the fact that we might be located geographically in North America, not all the states had the same access, the same benefits, the same possibilities to receive the vaccine, to receive mental health care, to receive counseling, you know, da, 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 so much, so much that's needed just to have enough, just And so even though there is not a ton of research that is actually pointing towards the impact that COVID has had in the younger generations, it's still, of course, as we all know, something that's unfolding and scientists and social scientists are working very hard to do a lot of that work that I do not do specifically. Um, but however, as a chaplain, I do pay attention to what is the impact from a psychosocial emotional perspective that COVID is having in Generation Z, for example. Older generations, younger generations, and the generations that are um, rising up or emerging contemporarily. And part of the, let me see where we are. Uh -huh. And part of the challenge of the COVID pandemic, as we see, is that it disrupted our ecology. It disrupted from a global perspective, our normal, whatever that means, ways of operating and being in the world, requiring that we physically and socially distanced. Now, from a chaplaincy perspective or from a chaplain for me, what's most um, luring is the fact that we're not just now separating ourselves physically, we are not just socially distancing, but that means that our opportunities of being proximate to each other as we're growing, as we're unfolding, as we're going from milestone to milestone, right, elementary, middle school, high school, got completely disrupted. That means that your graduations went out the door. There's no graduation. You're graduating in your room, if you have a room, or you're graduating somewhere. The plans and goals and dreams that you had were destroyed. And now you're coming into potentially college or again, having to move because now you need to be closer to family right, or closer to where you need to be to receive care or your community or belong to a network. And so notions of being then disoriented are at an all-time high. And then you begin to kind of settle, and you begin to see, or this is what the research is, is pointing towards, that there's gaps that there are aspects of emotional development and emotional intelligence that are not where they need to be. What, why am I bringing it up? Because you are saying in your 
mission and your vision that you're a community. And so that means that every person that comes through that door or the elevator or those stairs has very different lived experiences, challenges, difficulties, traumas that they are experiencing at the same time as they're coming to potentially a new community that might not be well known as maybe in comparison to other historical communities. And so how are we then listening to those transitions, to those processes, to those ruptures, to those traumas in a way that is ethically responsible? Right, so again, I got so excited when I saw that this was a, um, a building that provides counseling and mental health care to the LGBTQ community because it's so, so timely and relevant to really explore what does secular communities or a secular worldview have to offer from a multidisciplinary perspective in terms of care, in terms of deeply listening to the unfoldings of people, of communities, stories, and narratives that we are all carrying, again, as we're just trying to find our way. And then the last two points, if we're looking at the changes from a social perspective between generations, seeing that things that were a given before, so going to high school, completing high school, going to college, completing college, that's gonna lead you X, Y, and Z, which will then give you a house and then give you generational wealth or give you some form of social mobility, all of those realities have been disrupted. Maybe not so if you have a more robust um, network or familial network. Nonetheless, what happens, as I said in my introduction, to people that experience a first generation um, reality or have migratory or immigratory realities that they are navigating with aside from everything else that comes within the human condition. And so I mentioned all of that because it's so important as a secular community to always have awareness around how are we listening to ourselves, our moments of what would be called immunities of change, so resistance to understanding change within human relationships, institutions, and groups, and really pushing and saying, you know what, I caught myself. I, I'm doing that thing that I always do when I hear something that I don't agree with, that I don't fully understand, that I don't want to understand. Activating within me a particular trauma experience or challenge that I have not yet fully addressed or repaired. Because again, as a community, we're always working, right? Okay, and then now, since I know that we're a secular community, I'm gonna use a quote um, from a scientific perspective. Um, and again, this is a article, and I have the resource in the references if anyone is interested, basically looking at Generation C during the COVID-19 crises. This article, this is just one quote, please forgive me, I, I don't have the whole summary for you, but just for the sake of this talk, we're just gonna focus on this really looking at a comparative analysis of the difference between Generation C and Generation X, um, specifically looking at the notions of resilience, values, and attitude. So as I quote here, the current study, the one that I just cited, examines the attitudes of Generation C as compared to older generations in the context of attitudes towards flex flexible work flexible learning, and online consumption. Previous findings show that younger generations have higher levels of openness to change and lower levels of conservation values. Now again, why do I bring this into this space? Well, there's many reasons, but the few that I wanna mention is that hopefully you are interested in continuing to grow, to develop, to create healthy spaces where 
more people can come into this space. And not only come, but stay. And so if we give as a gift, <laughs> if we state as a given that we no longer only live in physical realities, but now we have been immersed in hybrid realities, where as we're seeing here, right, it might be being broadcasted, recorded, then it's shared on YouTube or live stream or any other platform, then that means that even though we're gathered here in Houston, anyone in the world can also at the same time be connected and thus can find community here. Now that might rock our minds of like, but they are not physically here. So how can they find community? Well, that's part of the challenge of engaging in transgenerational relations is that notions and concepts that for us are a given or have a specific form of being is not necessarily shared in the same way. And COVID definitely launched us, if not propelled us, catalyzed us into moving from the 20th century, at least from a higher ed perspective, to reckoning with the fact that, well, I guess we have to open up the classroom and not just the physical classroom, but actually the classroom from a virtual perspective. So that means that a student that was living here in the dorm next door to the professor, hypothetically, is now the same student, same professor here in Amsterdam or they're somewhere else in the world because they needed because they needed to relocate and reassess their life. The same thing happens with communities. How do we define and explore what membership means? How do we explore, listen and understand to what belonging is? Who gets to determine that? Who holds the power to have access to those possibilities? And so hybrid is really saying that while the younger generations might not necessarily have the same resilience because they don't have the same um, length of lived experience, they are from an intellectual and philosophical standpoint more flexible in their own lives and then bringing that into their workplace and saying, hypothetically speaking, but I have seen it, so how many times do I need to be in the office? Do I need to be here Monday to Friday, seven to four or whatever? Or what's my day where I'm actually online? While other folks are, as some of my professors, hopefully they don't listen to my talk, I'm so excited to go back to the classroom so that everything can go back to how it was because learning only happens when you're in the classroom. The same thing is applied in our context in secular humanist non-theist communities. Are we just expecting people to come through the door and everything is there for them or for us or a we? Or are we also recognizing that we have a physical reality, we have a hybrid reality, and that of course, we have the outside world. So how are we listening to the needs of our nearby neighborhoods and communities that might be demanding of us without us knowing a different way of showing up, of embodying our values? of embodying our ethics in ways that we are being co-conspirators with others, especially those that do not hold the same dimension of power? Or do we just like being in the chair and just being here under the AC, which is totally understandable? But if we are really living and practicing our values, let that be known. We don't do X, Y, and Z, or we cannot do X, Y, and Z yet. It's better than trying to say we do everything and then we don't do nothing at all. Okay, and now I love watching TV shows. Um, as a cultural studies scholar, I'm really into visual culture. 
um, visual studies, and there's this um, show that I watched um, several times, because of course there's several seasons, um, and it's called Merli, and this is a Spaniard um, show. And basically, I believe that they are, well, please forgive me, I cannot recall. They're in a higher um, educational setting. I'm forgetting if it's middle school, high school, college, my mind cannot recall. But all the students are basically connected to this philosophy professor. And this philosophy professor is really hoping to bring the students to appreciate philosophy. Again, given the context of the show, it's like, what the hell, we don't need philosophy, this is garbage, blah, blah, why do I need to come to the class, this is so boring, they're all dead. How relevant is this to our lives, right, when students are dealing with their own identities, belonging, family drama, trauma, um, and their own identities and unfoldings, all of that while coming to this class. Um, however, I want to have us read, well, I'll read it here for us, this quote that really caught my attention enough that I went back and found it and put it up. Um, and even though this is a show on Netflix, actually, um, let me put, up, put it up here, they did consult a professor um, from the University of, um, I think it's Barcelona, if I'm not mistaken, if I am, please forgive me, but he's an actual professor of philosophy, and he provided philosophical advice to um, the producers of the show. So a lot of the work that this um, character is doing is, is actual academic sound philosophy, just FYI. Um, so I'm going to read it. Vivimos en una especie de pantalla global donde todo el mundo quiere ser visible a cualquier precio. Dicho de otra manera, si no te muestras, no existes. We live in a kind of global screen where everyone wants to be visible at any price. In other words, if you don't show yourself, you don't exist. Now, of course, we're not hopefully going to get into philosophical debate. What is fascinating about this quote, at least for me, is that throughout the show, students are really grappling with how are they showing up in the school? How are they showing up with each other? How are they utilizing what they're learning in the classroom in the struggles and complexities of their own lives? And how are they being perceived by others? So for example, the most brilliant student at one point in time in the class, as they actually went to grad to college, excuse me, he found out that he was just, you know, a standard person, that he was not as brilliant as he thought he was around philosophical matters as it was in high school, even though it was the same professors. But he really grappled with the fact that, you know what, I have other colleagues with whom I had, right, difference, that I disregarded, that I didn't care for, that now in this stage, either have mastery or full grasp or full understanding of the material, they're doing their work, they're passing their exams, and yet this character is struggling with doing their work. Now, what relates to us in this community, again, is that we are showing ourselves in multiple dimensions. One is we are here, we are virtual, but also we're utilizing other platforms to get the mission and vision of the Oasis Network across. So you have a website, you have a Facebook, and you have other platforms that you're utilizing that demand other ways of approaching language, messages, images. Now, who has the time to do all that work? Well, I'll leave it up to you. But that requires different possibilities 
of engagement, of listening, and challenging our own, our own conditions of how we're navigating these multiple worlds as we're trying to do community. And so um, as a scholar practitioner, I always like to talk about philosophy, what's out there, you know, the world of ideas, but also I like to um, show that I am doing what I talk about what I, quote, preach about, um, and what I share with other communities in any context. And so I mentioned to Jacob that I was going to do this, so hopefully you're not all caught by surprise. But basically, um, my humanist chaplaincy decided to um, build coalition or relationship with Atheist United, which is a nonprofit secular organization in California, so from the two coasts, and actually began to think about, huh, so he's 35, and that's public, so you know, I'm not violating any private conversations, and I turned 31 a few months ago, and we were just reflecting and thinking about where are the opportunities, or where were the opportunities when we were slightly younger for us to come together as humanists, as free thinkers, as non-theists in the young adult bracket, so meaning 18 to 35, where we can come together, when, when we can begin to think about what, it, what are our possibilities of finding community, of building and strengthening communities across state lines, across the U.S. and beyond. And so we came up with this idea of kindling the humanist spark, igniting a network of young leaders, which hopefully will launch this summer at Tufts University under my chaplaincy and the support and sponsorship of Atheist United. And you're the first community that I'm actually presenting this to and doing a pitch of some sort. And part of it is because, again, I am very drawn to the fact that you are called the Oasis Network, right? So we are sharing um, in values and synergies um, in the work that's needed, not just to recognize that younger folks are not the predominant number in our humanist non-theist spaces, but how are we, as I'm saying here, recognizing our own lived experiences? How are we listening across and then how are we co-designing, and, and you see the word co, right, means together in collaboration, in equal standing across generations. So that what we are providing can actually be sustainable, can be robust, and can be relevant to all of us to the extent possible. Because as I like to say, everything is a work in progress. Instead of just saying, well, things don't exist for young adults, so let's just wait until they go beyond 35 so that we then can provide something. Um, and so let me go a little bit further. I'm going to then move us to the next slide. And my apologies, I, it looked better on my computer. So if you can't see it, I'm going to read it for us. Um, this experimental, experiential retreat, because again, we're being very intentional about the, the words we're using, aims to examine the context, processes, and activities to mobilize transgenerational connections and help promote coalition consciousness building. Here I am paraphrasing and quoting um, a scholar, Keating, um, among humanists and beyond. Because again, if we're following the trends, and I am not a statistician by any means um, at all, but if we are paying attention to what it's saying, as I am assuming you all know, more and more demographics and younger demographics are moving beyond traditional forms of being, existing, and sensing their way through, especially in, in the dimension of social um, ways of being, in terms of religion, ethics, and spirituality. Right, there are the spiritual but not religious, there are the nuns, there are the questionings, 
fluid, spiritually seeking. There's so many concepts. All of them are really pointing to the fact that the traditional structures, at least from the folks that are opting into participating in these um, surveys and in data collections are stating they no longer work. Or they don't work enough for me to stay. It does not mean that they're not informed or influenced or impacted by X, Y, and Z tradition. What it means is that I am no longer necessarily wanting to center my life around X label or category. And so I believe that humanists and non-theists and secular spaces, if we are doing the work to deeply and radically listen and accompany and care for, we have something to offer that is distinct from other many competing possibilities. Okay, and so if we then begin to pay attention to transgenerational partnerships, meaning <laughs> um, relationships and partnerships across the age spectrum or the unfolding of human development, then we have the opportunity to begin to integrate rigorous self, consciousness building, and solidarity. So again, how are we recognizing that as we are in different stages of life, we should not be bitching, pardon me, right, about X, Y, and Z, like I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50, oh, you know, you can't go back, you can only go forward, then how are we then allowing for others to be next to us to do the work that we might not necessarily have the capacity or ability or energy to do, but we might have the wisdom, we might have the resources, we might have the lived experience to allow for us to continue to build spaces, again, that are rigorous, um, that are healthy, and that are culturally relevant and sustaining. And so, um, lastly, before I move into a little bit of an exercise for us, not physical, but just um, something more dynamic, um, how are we then looking to develop ways of engaging in meaningful change? Because hopefully we're not just doing programming for the sake of um, programming, as I like to say. We're actually doing something where we are recognizing the current generations and that we are not necessarily phasing out or exiting left, but we're recognizing that there are other needs, other possibilities, other ways of knowing that merit the same platform and the same space. Okay, and then how might we then develop modes of attentive listening and rational witnessing. Mm. So here are just a few um, ideas that I want to provide for us. We began to account for the erasures and silences. What does that mean? That means the recognition that there are histories of communities that have been displaced that are not known, that are not taught in schools, that are not in the textbooks. For example, did you know that COVID is already in textbooks as a global historical phenomenon? In our own lifetime, right here, if you go get it right now, you can read it. We are part of lived history. So other people, younger folks, are reading about something they lived, but something that we also lived through at the same time. How are we then recognizing our different masks? The historical legacies of trauma, identity, factors that create the other, as Dr. Franz Fanon speaks about in his um, book, um, I'm forgetting the title, 
um, I'm forgetting the title. That's really bad for me. Um, nonetheless, he was a psychiatrist who really talked about the impact of psychological or psychiatric colonialism and how that impacts communities of color, specifically, of course, in, in his own positionings, um, black and Afro-Caribbean sub subjects and really understanding how um, white mask, and of course this is much deeper than, than we have time to, because I was just giving the marker. Um, nonetheless, how that impacts from a dominant cultural framework to then minoritize or marginalize communities, how those masks are then applied on ourselves, and that we're always trying to show ourselves in an unauthentic way, and vice versa. I will leave that for the Q&A if anyone is interested on. And then um, I provide my references here and I'll leave them up in case you wanna take a picture or look for them. Thank you very much.
fog comes slipping in on silent feet to brush the light of day away. For a second, my heart skips a beat. For what lies lurking in the gray? It's just a cloud. Feather floating in the air, a blanket covering the crowd. You can't pretend it isn't there. Only a cloud, grown too heavy for the sky. A wintry watercolor shroud, gone in the twinkling of an eye. I see you sitting in that silent space. The lights are shattered by the tears. Sure. Oh, sorry. I, I'm waiting. Yeah, if you can stand up and say you're just for... Yeah. Just a compliment, actually. Oh. I'm having to completely rethink how I handle and think about Generation Z. I realize that I have so many biases that I've approached mm. Generation Z with. And as someone that's kind of like at the end of Generation X, uh, just thank you <laughs> for helping me unravel that. So mm. now I've got to completely rebuild it. <laughs> Thank you That's for your thing. comment. Positive. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Tim. Th that was a great talk. Appreciate that. Um, I have a comment, pretty much. Um, so, I'm a baby boomer, no doubt. I have a, a niece that is, I guess, millennial. She's 39. Has two c college degrees. I found myself judging her mm. for not pursuing higher employment, and. Uh, once I got into deep thinking and talking to her, she's, she's all about g gig economy or gig work and uh, eight to five is not her, and I, judged, I was judging her for that. Now, I, I'm a liberal guy, I'm open to lots of stuff, but I still have that narrow-minded thinking sometimes as I was judging her, and it really put a, a, a breach between us until I could dial that thinking back and talk to her and, uh, and understand that mm. what she's doing is exactly what she wants to do and she loves it. So anyway, I appreciate the talk. Um, appreciate, uh, thanks again. Thank you, Tim. You know, I, I think what you're mentioning, Tim, is I, I think a concern of any parent, um, son, daughter, kin, whatever framework you want to utilize about a real concern about possibilities of the future. And especially grappling with, well, this is how I did it. <laughs> and so, of course, if I did it, you should be able to do it even better than what I did, right? And at times, that's the frameworks we have, and that's the tools and the resources and the language that we can utilize, and that's the reality of it, right? But how can, as some of you were saying, recognize that those are prejudices, biases, miscommunication across generations that we hold, how can we listen then to better understand? Not to formulate a response or a rebuttal or a challenge, but actually say like, you know what? The economy was different. Everything was literally different. Now it's more challenging and more complex. And now a degree, 
whatever that is, even a medical degree, an engineering degree, a law degree does not equivalent um, financial um, solvency anymore. And so how are then our current generations, including any generation, developing ways to responding in a way that is also being aware or protective of their energy and their well-being, right? So the notion of like, I'll work myself to death, which literally happens, as a lot of you might know, might not necessarily be the same philosophy that others have and are saying, you know what, I'm willing to earn much less and have better sound mind and well-being than going, fill in the blank, and it's just dreadful. To build off what you've been talking about, um, through personal experience from what my generation viewed as important, being ignored mm -hmm. by the higher generations, Sure. I made a decision a long time ago that no matter what is important to the generations below me, um, you know, 50 years from now, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. I will listen and I will consider it valid even though I don't understand it. And so when you were talking about transgenerational uh, listening, that was something that I feel like I've already kind of come to terms with because of how it wasn't being done for me. Mm -hmm. So Thank you, I Matt. appreciate it. I'm following the microphone, sorry. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, my question is, practically, how do you do this? L do you have like discussion groups, or are you talking more about in our day-to-day -day lives to implement this, or both? All of it. <laughs> yes, definitely the everyday life for me is crucial. You hopefully are practicing it, failing forward, failing backwards. Hopefully, as Matt mentioned, it's a commitment that you begin to develop, right? That, of course, it's not perfect. We can always do better. But yes, everyday life. Um, as a chaplain, I do that with the humanist community that I supervise and mentor and care for that have their own board and their own resources. Nonetheless, as a trained um, chaplain, I am able to provide that care. And then with other nonprofits and secular spaces where I serve. So I do try to do the micro, the meso, and the macro um, within our communities, or non-theist ecologies. Uh, this is gonna be our final question. Oh. Well, uh, I'll let you go and then we can. Um, yeah. So actually just kind of more of a comment sure. uh, sure. from a practical side of like living and experiencing with um, across multiple generations. Yeah. Uh, I would to kind of point out the commonality, like people are people, right? So we believe and want to live life to what we think is important, right? So you talk about people who, you know, work themselves to death, that's because they did what they thought would give their lives value, Sure. you know, and those of us who are younger and then those who are younger than I, you know, they're just trying to live their lives with value. They're trying to give um, their experiences meaning. So yeah, that's kind of all I had to say. The last thing I'll say as a closing, if you are below 35 and would love to connect about the project that I mentioned, please um, either come to lunch with us or reach out to me. I would love to connect and see how we can get you up to Tufts this summer to spend a few days with us. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. So it seems like every week I'm reading in the paper about, peop about how people are just not hanging out anymore. Um, a lot of people are we're using these, our computers, our tablets, we're on Facebook or TikTok or whatever, and we're and just not hanging out in person as much. Um, part of that was the pandemic. Um, some of us learned during the pandemic that we kind of like, like our own company. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've kind of maybe gotten a little lazy about reaching out to be with other folks in real life. The jury is still out on what that's gonna do for us or against us. 
as regards our mental health. So to that end, this is going to be my pitch for all of the different things the Oasis community is doing. We meet in bars, we meet in restaurants, we meet in private homes, we meet at movie theaters. There are lots of ways that y'all can hang out. So on February 24th, um, next Saturday, we're having a bar night to meet with our speaker for the next Sunday, Josh Bowen. Um, and you can read, a lot of these are gonna be in the bulletin or you can go on the website for more details. On February 28th, there is book club. Will Judy, I think, or who's, who's in charge of that book club? Ted and Ginger, okay. So again, you can read about that or ask them. On, let's see, March 2nd, there is going to be a homeless outreach downtown. Um, the, what committee is doing this? The, the outreach committee? Volunteer committee. They're soliciting um, donations of blankets and then they're gonna go give the blankets out on March 2nd downtown. So again, read, look on your bulletin, talk to Graham over here, has the information um, if you're interested in that. Um, we have a, on February 21st, there's a third in a series of UFO documentaries that's gonna be held at our friend's Ken's Mediterranean Restaurant. We like people who have restaurants that they open up to us. <laughs> So look for that. And then on March 2nd, there's gonna be another movie night, which is uh, a viewing of Dune 2, which is I think out at the Marky Edwards, out on Katy Freeway. Memorial so, excuse me? Memorial City Mall. Oh, that's right, Memorial City Mall. Um, and then, Will, do you wanna come up and talk about the, the documentary real quick? that y'all are gonna trying to put together? Okay, so there's a movie that was released on Friday called God and Country, the and ampersand, whatever, directed, I'm sorry, produced by Rob Reiner. So it's about an hour and a half long documentary. Uh, the only place you can see it here in Houston is the marquee on, that's, uh, on I-10 near Ikea. That's the only theater that it, uh, you can see it at. You can't stream it yet. But uh, it's gonna be a big deal if it's not already. It's gonna cause a lot of ruffles in the belief community. It is basically a glaring spotlight like this um, on Christian nationalism, what it is, why it's so bad. And there was a ton of belief people, believers in the movie giving voice to it saying, this is BS, that we, this is a twisting of our religion. It, the movie gets it, goes, go, goes into it superbly. Uh, very, it's a very powerful movie. So. I am, I am, as we speak, trying to get an, ev an interfaith event together around this movie. Now, it's not going to be at the theater. It's been a, a, it's a lot of work, but uh, there will be two dates. This is all tentative, February 26th and March 1st. That's a Monday and Friday. We're going to have a screening at a small place called 14 Pews. Uh, stay with me. Stay with me. <laughs> it's an old, old theater, a really small place, like a house slash theater, and we can rent it out. Uh, there's going to be interfaith people coming in, there, and again, I'm the state director for American Atheists. Stay with me. There are a lot of really cool uh, Christians, Jews, uh, interfaith people pushing back on Christian nationalism even harder than we are. They they they're repulsed by it, uh, and they're doing a terrific job. So, Americans United, uh, interfaith ministries, some UU churches. I'm going to try to get them their people in this space. I need us to represent. If if you find this important, even if you don't and you're just thinking about it, it is important. But I want this to work. I need us secular people, non-believers to be in attendance. It's not official yet, but I'm kind of giving you a, a forewarning. Uh, plug into our Houston Oasis meetup and the information will pop up as soon as I get this event, which hopefully is in the next couple of days uh, so, uh, finalized. Go ahead and see it on your own. Again, uh, it's playing at the Marquee, Edwards Marquee, but the events that I just uh, mentioned, they'll be ticketed events. So if you see it on your own, you're gonna have to pay again for it to be at the screening. But you, what you get for that money, you get to hang out with interfaith people. Uh, you get to discuss it with believers and us uh, heathens. 
Uh, so that it's money well spent, I think. And I'm going to try to see if Oasis can kind of sponsor some tickets as well. I just say this right now. It's a, it's a, it's a surprise to the board, but I'm on the board. Uh, and I'm going to try to get press there. So this is a way for us to be visible, us being secular people, pushing back on Christian nationalism, pushing back on theocracy. I want it to be advertised. So I'm going to work hard. We're trying to get it uh, uh, advertised out to the normies as well, to the, to, the, to the wider world. So plug into our meetup, information coming. On a very side note, early voting starts February 20th and goes through March 1st. Make a plan to vote on these primaries. It's very important. Thanks. Okay, uh, so a couple more. Um, we do actually have a card night, uh, Oasis cards. We have changed the night. We used to meet on Wednesday nights, and it turned out that was just really difficult for a lot of y'all to make. So we have now changed it um, to Saturday, 5 to 7. Again, um, Ch Richard Andrews is the person to contact on that. He can add you to the email, and we'll send you an email out about where we're meeting, and he can get you set up for that. And then um, we, on March 10th, are going to have a town hall, which the board will put on and will kind of be a state of oasis uh, talk, give you an idea of where we are financially, you know, what our vision is for the year, all that kind of stuff. So we ho really hope that y'all will come so that you can see where we're going and where we've been. And so then that, now I get to do the financial pit. Excuse me. Ah, okay. Did you hear that? Houston Oasis spring break trip from March 4th to the 14th. Okay. So, here's the deal. We don't pay for silver chalices, and we don't pay for fancy robes. We don't have a pipe organ that needs maintenance all the time. What we do have is we have to pay for this space. And we have to pay for storage to bring all of our sound equipment that we have had to buy. We pay for um, the room, we pay for a child care person so that people who want to bring their children have a place to put them, you know, so that they can enjoy the talks. Um, all of that costs money. So we would really appreciate it if you could make a donation. If recurring donation that really helps us because if we don't know how much we're going to be getting in it's really hard to budget <laughs> and those recurring donations no matter how small help us to know what we've got coming in and what we can afford to spend and what we can afford to save for it's just really crucial so I just want to put that out there there's a hat in the back and there's, and you can use the back of the, there's a little QR thingy here for those who are technologically adept <laughs> to use. Yeah. Yes, yes, we, abs we absolutely take checks. We also have um, our, have a bunch of committees and there are some information about the committees on the table back there, the names of the committees, and the contact person. We have things like a volunteer committee, a social outreach committee, a speakers committee, just all the different, co the committees make this organization run. So we also, if we not, oh, and Deborah Hurley, yeah, you can talk to Deborah. So it's not just financial help that we need, it's also blood, sweat, and tears help <laughs> so that we can keep ourselves going. So I think that is all I have. Anybody else have anything they?
Okay. 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 All righty. So I think that is it for all of our announcements. So we're going to have Joseph come up and, oh, excuse me. Oh, yeah, yes. Jennifer did such a good job on a treasurer announcement. I was going to just leave it at that, but okay. Two things real quick, because we have to move on. Uh, charitable contribution receipts. So I have emailed them out to everybody. I'm your treasurer, Tim Wise. Hi. Um, if you did not receive them, come get me and we'll, I'll go through my list and make sure that we line that out. Uh, check your spam folder because it went to your email. Um, the pledge drive. Remember, we are in a pledge drive right now from February 2nd to our town hall meeting on the 10th. So uh, we have a goal of $10,000. It's going to be 100% matched for any contribution to $75 up to $1,000. Um, our total balance of that drive at the moment, unmatched, is $2,586. So good job, everybody. All right, now we can go forward. Okay, um, this is a song I just wrote that's kind of light and fun. Uh, I always wanted a song about a vacation spot, like, you know, James Taylor has Mexico, Van Halen has Cabo, then there's Kokomo by the Beach Boys, so this song's called Cozumel. <laughs> Citadel. I wrote this song to tell you just how deep I fell in love with you, my bell. I'm gonna say farewell to paradise. All right, thank you. Oh, we went to Cozumel, and all I did was write songs. I didn't even like do scuba diving or anything like that. Could have done that at home. Uh, so I play in a band called The Drift Around Town, and this next song is one I did with the band, and you can find it on Spotify. Um, you'd have to do The Drift TX, because there's like 8,000 The Drifts <laughs> in America, and that's a band fight that's been going on for years um, that I don't wish to talk about. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, you can find this called Art Museum. It's, it's on 
your favorite streaming platform, you have to do the Drift TX to find that. So I have solo stuff under Joseph Crump, six or seven songs, and then the Drift TX. Uh, so this one's called Art Museum. I never know what to say when people disagree. They think I'm wrong, I'm holding on to what I want the world to be. But they shouldn't close their eyes. But they shouldn't close their eyes to all the majesty. Everywhere you see in the world, and yet I've heard for us to feed our weary soul. Then let's get lost in a big art museum We can lose our bearings, no despair Think that we have a lot to discover If we open up our hearts and minds tonight Imagination taking place So if you keep it away and you sow the cane, it's never too late to enjoy the buffet. It's been that out for you, and if you only knew what you pick, what is beauty and passion can do, you make more of an effort to take in the view, because life is its meaning if you don't pursue the love. Love, 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 love. Thank you. I'm Joseph Crump. Always good to be back. Boy, are we lucky to have him. Thank you so much. Also, a big thanks to our speaker today, Anthony. If you would like another opportunity to speak with our scholar in residence today, we have lunch at Cat's Deli, which is over here on Montrose. Um, Cats with a K, right, not cats like meow cats, but cats with a K, on Montrose and Westheimer, just off, it's on Westheimer, but just off of Montrose. So thank you all for coming today. Go in peace to love and, to love and listen deeply.